Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great opportunity for me to be here. Um, I would like to give a presentation on the ERC. And as an institution, the ERC has uh, many sides uh, that you could talk about. But uh, basically, I want to um, talk with you or, or present to you uh, first a brief history of the ERC, um, then highlight a few points what it means that the, what the ERC is as a policy instrument. And then um, most of the time, I hope um, I will divert to um, discuss with you um, what funding a la ERC means. So that basically I will um, present um, what, how the ERC allocates its funding, which is usually known as peer review. Um, I have some general remarks in advance um, because um, I would like also to highlight here that um, the IST and the ERC have um, some similarities in their history. Um, uh, both are founded as a strong political statement um, in the mid-2000s. Um, after years of, uh, I think, very strong campaign by scientists, both in the case of the ERC and the IST, this is the fact. Um, and um, I think it's also not by chance that um, the founding of these two organizations has been happening in around 2006, 2007. Um, because it was, in retrospect at least, a time when politicians had a very strong um, interest in long-term investment in basic science. Um, and I think the IST and the ERC are both an expression of that, of that belief. Um, we are now probably in, in different times. Um, we can talk about that also a little bit later. Um, it's also that the two histories converge at one point. It, it, it's in some way. As uh, Oliver Lehmann already highlighted, um, IST strongly rel relies on ERC funding. Um, don't have to go into that in more details. Um, Oliver already presented the numbers. But also for the ERC, the IST is sort of the model institution, I think, because it clearly highlights that um, it clearly highlights, highlights a belief of the ERC founding fathers and mothers, namely that um, if you only create the right environment for science and for, for excellent science anywhere in Europe, um, you can be successful with that. And I think the IST has been very successful in the last 10 years. So, uh, But that I would also like to congratulate this institution for belatedly for its 10th anniversary and its leadership. Um, yeah. Okay, let me start with the historical excourse on the ERC. Um, it's important when, when this whole journey uh, started. Um, there was talk about the NERC, a, a European Research Council, modeled after the National Science Foundation in the US already in the 1950s. And in a way, this idea was simmering um, always when there was discussion about extending Europe, the European Union or the European Community, um, as it was called earlier, uh, and so on. But it really, the idea of an ERC really took hold um, around 2000 for two reasons. The first, first was um, that there was, uh, that the heads of state, of member states, um, adopted the so-called Lisbon strategy which had the very ambitious goal to make Europe the most competitive and the most dynamic knowledge-based economy in the world. Now, for some reason, there is good evidence that this has not been achieved so far. Um, but it was a very strong you know, political um, framework within which different actors then could uh, reorient themselves and ask for a new avenue towards how to organize um, science in Europe. Um, and around the same time, um, there was also adopted, for some reason, not in close collaboration with the Lisbon strategy, but um, uh, at the same time, basically, the so-called European research area, which is also still around as a, a policy framework today, um, which starts with the interesting, I think it's a 40 or 50 page document by the European Commission. And, and it starts with the, with the sentence, the situation concerning research is worrying in Europe. Um, and it's an interesting contrast between 
the status quo that is um, in this uh, era document and the, between the Lisbon strategy that aims for this long-term goal to make Europe uh, competitive and dynamic and so on. Um, and the contrast is basically that those, the people who were, who were responsible for, for um, research in Europe back then, they were not very happy with how research and development was done by, by and large. They were not happy with how much money or how little money was spent on research and development by then. Um, and they were also not very happy with how um, research funding was organized in Europe, which, is, which was and still is today um, in, this, in, the framework, in, the, in, the, in the policy framework of the so-called framework program for research, which I guess most of you will know. Um, and it is in this context that um, the miracle of the ERC um, took place. The miracle of the ERC is not something that I... It's a, it's a quote from the first president of the ERC, Fotis Kafatos, whom some of you may still remember. Um, and and um, in, this, in this context of um, a, a push towards more European science and more spending on, uh, on at European level for research, um, it is that this ERC took, uh, took hold. And basically, you can um, divide it in three phases. The first one is the, what I call the ERC campaign. The second, it's going from 2000 to 2003. The second one is uh, the, when the European Commission took over this campaign and made it into a political viable, politically viable campaign. Um, and the third phase then was from 2005 to 2007, when basically the ERC was set as an idea. It was clear that um, it will be funded, uh, founded, um, and then it was more or less about hammering out um, the details about the ERC as it stands now. So let me briefly go into these three, into these three um, phases, uh, which I think is important for you to also understand a little bit what I will talk later about, what the constraints of the ERC, the internal constraints and, and tensions of the ERC are. Um, during the ERC campaign, um, this was basically carried by a group of self-organized high-level researchers. And they had, they shared, they had different ideas about what an ERC should be. Uh, but they had one ideological, ideological conviction. They wanted to fund European research, most, mostly basic research, and they thought that European research deserved better than what was available back then. Um, there is this quote that I have here, uh, Loch, Nech, Los, Loch Ness Monsters, um, was a quote in uh, Science magazine of 2002 by uh, an eminent Swedish uh, researcher and then director of the Karolinska Institute, uh, Hans Wicksell, um, and he called the framework programs um, Loch Ness Monsters of bureaucra Bureaucracy. Um, so that gives you an idea what, what, the, what, the, what the mood was towards the framework programs among these eminent researchers. The ERC campaign was carried basically by um, a range of conferences that took place in this period, and there were also ad hoc committees um, of different style, the European Science Foundation, ESF, which was very prominent back then, not today anymore, um, played a certain role, and others as well. Um, um, and the basic idea was to push for a European Research Council as an alternative to the framework program. This is important uh, to keep in mind. Um, the main problem of this campaign, of course, was there was no pattern, there was no political organization that said, okay, we'll take this up and we will carry it through the European institutions and make it real. Um, there was no structure, there was no idea how the, what the ERC really should be. There were vast ideas from, you know, what the ERC actually is today, this investigator-driven um, research for small teams, but there were also ideas that it should fund infrastructures in Europe and so on and so on. So it was really a, a total mixture. And most essentially, of course, there was no money. Um, you would have to have a commitment from some side to spend money uh, to, fund this, um, um, this, to fund this ERC. And this is a quote from one of the 
persons who were very critical um, of the ERC, also from the scientific community back then, um, who was the chair of the UK Medical Council back then, uh, George Rada, and he complained basically like this doesn't make any sense to talk about this ERC at all because everybody is talking about something different. So what, what, what's the big deal? <clears throat> then eventually um, there was a shift um, and the shift was that uh, the European Commission, to be more precise, the leadership of the European Commission uh, did uh, the Directorate General, the Commissioner for Research and the Director General for Research for the, for the DG, um, changed their mind. Initially, they had been very critical of this ERC idea and they said, well, if you want this ERC, then the member states should do it. We don't want to have anything to do with it. But at one point in 2003, they changed their mind and they basically took over this ERC campaign. Um, they had, of course, their own interests. Um, they expected from an ERC that it would have a, a, you know, a certain kind of reform impulse on the rest of the framework program, which they were also rather critical of. Um, they also basically said, well, with an ERC, we can add academic research funding to our, and to our portfolio, which means that we not only have then, you know, more the technical, technological development and more the challenges side of what uh, European funding is, but we also can then, for the first time, um, um, offer funding for uh, universities uh, on a large scale. Um, and of course, back then, the negotiations of the seventh framework program were already starting, um, and um, the Commission leadership thought, well, it, embracing an ERC will help us to argue for mo more money in general. Uh, for the next framework program. So those were very, you know, very clear self-interests by the Commission. Um, but the Commission was very important because it basically meant that um, the campaign that was then emerging um, made the ERC very different than what it was thought initially in this early phase of the campaign. The ERC would become a part of the framework program. It was not, no longer an alternative to the framework program. It would have a substantial budget, one to two billion euros a year. Um, and it was argued by a very clever um, slogan that was a new kind of European added value, competition based on excellence, instead of how um, research, was research funding was argued before. Research argued, uh, funding before was argued through collaboration. The idea was that if you have um, uh, a research project that is um, carried out by University A in country in, in France and University B, a team of University B in country Germany and so on and so on, then you would, you know, um, create some kind of European added value. And the new kind of European added value that was brought in through this ARC was that you have a comp European-wide competition um, for funding. Um, and of course the notion of frontier research was then also added basically also a very instrumentalist um, notion in the way that um, the Commission feared that if they used the term basic research, financial ministers would not uh, be happy with it. So they came up with this idea of uh, frontier research. But basically it means basic research, basically it's academic research. Okay, so the last phase very briefly is then uh, between 2005 and 2007 when legally basically everything was set. Um, 2007, of course, beginning of the framework program, so in the phase before, there was um, the Scientific Council, uh, which is the steering body, an independent steering body of the ERC, was uh, convened for the first time in late 2005. Um, the, this Scientific Council then developed the scientific strategy um, of the ERC in the next, let's say, 15 months. And then there was the formal inception in 2007 with the new framework program, um, which then um, which, is why, which is the reason why today, of this, week, uh, this year officially is the 10th anniversary of the ERC. My personal opinion should be 2005 because the Scientific Council meeting was really the, the initial, the initial uh, starting point of the ERC, but yeah. Um, and then the first funding call deadline in May 2007 um, for the first starting grant call of the ERC. Um, yeah, that's 
a brief history of the ERC and, and since then it's running all these funding schemes and, and, and since then you basically know what the ERC is. Um, it hasn't changed, it hasn't, it hasn't changed substanti substantially since then. Um, let me briefly also say some, a few things about the ERC as a policy instrument. What is the ERC? The ERC is, a, um, is um, directed or led by an independent steering body. This is this uh, scientific council. And it's important to understand that the scientific council is really unique in Europe in the sense that there is no other expert um, group um, established by the European Commission that has so much um, 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 autonomy and so much operational influence on, 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 on uh, in general than the, than the scientific council. This is, really, um, this is really something where the commission apparently um, was willing to um, um, forego its own principles. Usually uh, um, expert groups are very, have a very um, limited remit and the scientific council is really unique in that sense. Um, it's important to highlight that. Um, the other thing that makes the ERC unique in the European context, in the transnational context, is that it, that it allocates its funding based only on the scientific quality of proposals. Um, this is not the case, more or less not the case, um, in most other uh, funding schemes um, of the, <coughs> of the um, European Commission. Uh, we could discuss, of course, a little bit about uh, the Marie Curie and, uh, and the FET. Um, um, but um, on a broad basis, the ERC is the only one that, that has this focus on only scientific quality. If you look at it globally, these two features are not an innovation. Funding agency, nat national funding agencies are characterized by these two features for a long time. The National Science Foundation in the US sci uh, since 1950 is run by an independent um, um, National Science Board. Um, it is a completely independent uh, organizational structure uh, and it basically also still funds um, scientific quality proposals and nothing else. Um, what is unique for the ERC is that it is the first time that it is acting, that it is transforming these two principles on a transnational space. And this brings certain unique effects that you don't see with other funding agencies. Most importantly for ERC grantees, of course, is the symbolic, is the symbolic value that goes along with the, with the big chunk of money that you get. Um, if you are an ERC grantee, you are recognized in Portugal as you are in Norway or in Austria. If you have an FAF start, um, um, Startpreis, which is basically the equivalent of the FAF in Austria, you recognize in Austria, but explain a colleague in Portland, Portugal what the um, FAF's uh, Startpreis is, um, will not be recognized immediately. <coughs> There's also the aspect of mobility, of course. Um, with an ERC grant, you can take your ERC grant and you can say, well, institution in UK offers me be a better um, environment or whatever, I take this ERC grant and go there. Um, I think this institution has gained a few um, of its people also through this uh, principle. Um, a lot of other institutions in Europe did, actually. Um, so this is also something that you do not, can, can, cannot do with the national uh, funding um, um, per se. Um, and then there is, um, particularly for policymakers, this interesting um, component that you can, ERC grants are so easy to compare. Um, it was been more often than once that I have, when I was still with Helga Novotny, that I've witnessed um, two or three rectors or directors of universities coming together and the first thing they do is immediately that they compare how many ERC grants do you have, how many do you have, you know. And of course national ministries do the same um, and it's even some kind of a quality, um, I think even in the innovation scoreboard of the European uh, Commission in the meantime, um, this is one of the indicators, how many ERC grants go to country X and so on and so on. So those are effects that only a transnational funding agency can, uh, <coughs> can uh, evoke. Um, that is not to say that everything is very easy for the ERC. Um, you may have um, heard about it, uh, there is also a, a 
They did an article in the, in the newest edition of Science Magazine by Helga Novotny about um, the next 10 years of the ERC, where she raises her concerns about where the, where, what the future of the ERC will be. Um, basically, the ERC um, is not an independent organization. It is a part of the now eighth framework program edition, which is called Horizon 2020. It is um, not a single institution, but it is a legal compound of three different entities. Um, it has this mission to fund frontier, basically academic research, um, and um, it has this 17% of, uh, the, of, the, um, of the framework program budget, which is more or less 0.5 to 1% of the overall total EU uh, research and development spending. Um, and there are, I think, basically three future challenges for the ERC. Um, for the next for the next upcoming years, um, and I'm not talking about challenges that are more or less coming from external effects like you know Brexit or whatever. So if 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 European Union for some reason is changing its scope entirely, of course this will have effects on the ERC as well. But this is this is not the this is not the kind of challenges that I want to talk about here. Um, the first challenge is that the ERC has this unique mission in the European context. Um, but it is also part of the framework program, it's part of the commission, that, has, that means there is always a very strong um, impetus also on efficiency and an accountability. So there are two tasks um, that the ERC has to carry out. The first one is to identify the best applications based on excellence uh, only, and this is basically how the ERC is organized around, and I will talk about that a little bit uh, more about later. Um, but it's also to pay out uh, money along EU financial regulations, and those are very protected, protracted uh, regulations, I can tell you. Um, so the picture I brought you here is, I don't know if any one of you ever did, um, has been a panel member of the, of the ERC. If, if so, you may recognize this. It's in the, in the 24th floor of the ERC headquarters, a, a signpost. And it has a very grandiose saying. It says the European Research Council Executive Agency is dedicated to selecting and funding the excellent ideas that have not happened yet and the scientists that are dreaming them up. Very grandiose. And um, then if you look at this signpost, you see it is um, printed on a cheaply looking woven fabric, um, which really makes you wonder how, how that, that goes together. But I think it is, is a very good expression of um, how this world-class ambition of the ERC and this cost-cutting mentality that is carrying the executive agency are falling together here. Um, then a second challenge for the ERC, of course, is that there are repercussions of these effects that I told you before. So um, one that is not maybe directly affecting the ERC again, but um, which is of could be of concern for policymakers at least, that, that um, certain universities have started to, you know, um, give up their own rights to select who gets a tenure position and simply say, well, if you have an ERC grant, then you will have a tenure position. Um, it is really the question if that makes sense in the context of a university, which is not only about research, but also about teaching and a lot of other obligations, but be that so. Um, more directly a problem it is for the ERC is when you look at the distribution of ERC grants, as I said before, this is um, kind of a mind game for poli policymakers in Europe nowadays. Um, how many grants do we have? How many do others have? And of course, the ERC basically shows that there are regions in Europe that are very strongly performing. Um, and then there are regions where only very few ERC grants are going to. Um, and then there are calls by policymakers who say, well, we have to make sure that this distribution is um, more equal. We have to make sure that the so-called underperforming countries uh, will gain a bigger share. Um, and uh, the question here is really, um, is, that, is that what the ERC should do? Or is the ERC rather the instrument that highlights the difficulties for researchers in certain areas in Europe and it is then the task for policymakers to make sure that they are better, that there is a better environment for these researchers in the, those countries. Um, so the, the graph that I have here is it's just an example from an old um, ERC internal um, um, analysis. 
Um, it shows that uh, the, the top 10% top 10 publications um, in a country, starting with UK and going down, and um, in, uh, in yellow you see the, share, the, the amount of ERC grants for that country. And basically this should highlight that um, um, more or less um, the better your research environment and the better your output is, the higher is also the number of ERC grants that you get. So um, the, the question of course is, um, do, you want to, do you want to change it that and how and do you want to use the ERC to change that? Um, and then there is the third challenge, I think, and for me personally, it's the one that I'm most concerned with. It, it, that's basically the question, whom does the ERC belong to? Um, and here I just give you this quote from Helga Novotny from, from, from this uh, Science Magazine article. Um, the ERC has been a unique and bold experiment to put the scientific community in charge. It must safeguard this position. The fact that Helga feels convinced to tell the scientific community that this should be the case can tell you a little bit about that she is concerned about something. We can talk about that later too. Okay, um, I'm coming to the third part. Um, attracting applications or the funding a la ERC. Um, and basically the ERC of course is nothing else but um, a, a machinery that um, receives um, a lot of applications to, for funding and then somehow digests all these, um, this raw material and then spits out a rank list which says these are the 10% proposals that are funded and the other ones, sorry, you, you're, not, you're not funded. Um, <clears throat> there are basically three uh, funding opportunities with the ERC. I'm sure that you are all aware of this. Um, there's a starting grant, the consolidated grant and the advanced grant. And all funding streams are um, modeled after the same principle, more or less. Uh, they're all investigator-driven. There are no predetermined fields, no topics, no missions um, for calls. Um, they are open to all fields of science and scholarship, so it really has this strong emphasis on Wissenschaft in the German sense and not uh, science in the English sense. And, as I said before, it is decided on the sole criterion of excellence. So, but what really does that mean? Um, to legitimize a funding decision, you, you have to have a certain principle that, is, um, that justifies to those who are not re on the receiving end that they are um, not on the receiving end. And peer review, more or less, has been the one principle that has been employed very successfully to achieve this kind of legitim leg legitimization or justification. Um, but peer review, um, and I've looked into the literature dealing with peer review a lot um, when I was writing the book. Um, I was very unhappy because peer review is used in a very, there, there's a lot of confusion about what peer review actually is. Um, now I would like to make two differentiations. The first is um, that peer review is not only a principle, but is also a procedure. And the second one is that you can deploy peer review at different areas. Um, the original place where peer review was used um, is, of course, in academic publishing, um, as, you all, as you all know it. Um, but since the 1950s, increasingly, and of course in close collaboration with uh, the fact that more and more taxpayers' money is going to um, fund academic research, it has also been deployed in, at the fringe of the academic or the scientific culture, namely um, at uh, research funding. The allocation, allocating the funds through peer review um, achieves um, a dual legitimacy. It achieves the teacher's legitimacy uh, towards uh, the scientists. As I said, in the case of the ERC, 90% don't get the, the funding and um, they, they are basically have to be happy with the fact that the peers have decided that they are not on the receiving end. But it also achieves legitimacy in the first place to those who allot the money to the ERC, the policymakers. So it has to, has to have this dual leg legitimacy. Um, there are two objects of evaluation. It's the uh, CV and the proposal. This is, of course, a, um, a stark 
a stark uh, an important difference to um, to uh, what is going on in academic publishing, where you only look at the uh, where you ask the peers only to look at the at the draft of a of a written um, of a of, of a written text, um, and in uh, um, um, research funding, the use of peer review uh, peer review is used not only to look at the quality of the proposal, and I think this is a very important thing. Um, it is not only to look at the quality. Where in publishing, if you are if you have written up your your text and you submit it to a to a journal, um, it's basically the result of your of your research of the last months, years, whatever. Um, so. Basically, you can say what is judged upon is, is, your, is, is the quality of what you have written up there. But in the, in the fact of a research proposal, you are projecting something into the future. So it is not only the quality of what you've written, it is also that the peers always assess the promise of what you, are, what you, what you intend to do with the money, and it is also about the feasibility of what you intend to do. So this, of course, makes peer, peer review in uh, research funding much more complex um, than it is um, in, uh, in publishing. And it is, of course, the peers who are responsible for balancing and judging. If we look, um, as I said before, the ERC is basically a funding machinery. If you look, um, for example, I only have this graph until 2014, but you could extend it, of course. If you look at this, um, if you look at this graph, you, you briefly see the um, the um, um, overall budget of the of the of the ERC in uh, in grey, um, which has um, risen to um, approximately 1.6 billion in 2014. Um, then in uh, in the dotted line is the number of applications that has been received annually for all funding streams of that year for all funding calls. You see, in 2007, the first starting grant call had was heavily oversubscribed. Um, then it dropped down, uh, but since then it has, has risen again. So it is now almost 10, in 2013 you had um, almost 10,000 proposals in one year that had to be processed by the, by the ERC executive agency. And then the, the normal line is the line that tells you um, um, how many uh, proposals have been funded. Um, and uh, the percentage tells you the um, um, the um, the, the success rate between the submitted proposals and those that had, have uh, actually been funded. So that just should tell you, give you an idea um, uh, with how many proposals the ERC is dealing every year um, and how it has to, you know, um, have to have a very solid and robust procedure in order to, at the end, always come to a conclusion that uh, achieves this dual legitimacy um, that I talked before about. Um, and of course, there are a certain inconsistency of, of peer review. Um, they have been discussed ever since peer review has been used in uh, research funding. Um, so the history goes also back to the 1950s, basically. Um, those inconsistencies um, are basically because there are three implicit expectations to the peers, more or less. Um, who do the assessment of, uh, of, of the proposals. Um, the first one is that um, the only ambition is to advance science. And since scientists are human beings, we all know that um, we are not all driven only by um, looking at the scientific uh, quality of something, but there are very often also different um, conceptions in our heads. Um, so there, there have been a lot of stories, of course, um, a lot of analysis, of course, about how biased this peer review and so on and so on. Um, the second expectation is that reviewers are open to new avenues, um, which is also not always the, care, uh, the case, because um, academic tribes, as you know, disciplines um, have very strong, um, exert a very strong uh, power on how, how people then actually read proposals. And sometimes they say, well, this is crazy because this is not how I'm used to think of. So you really have to have people who are open-minded. Um, um, otherwise, um, the whole idea that you, that you push the frontier of science through this kind of um, research assessment is, uh, is, uh, is not working. 
And then, of course, there is um, an important inconsistency that's happened that's, that's of concern, particularly in the last uh, two decades, I think. Um, that is that the reviewers and also the applicants uh, basically do this for free. Um, it is an old tradition that peer review basically is something that you do aside your usual work. Um, but um, there are studies um, um, that show that uh, by now re scientists um, spend more than 30% of their work uh, life during a uh, month um, only doing either writing reviews or uh, writing proposals that then have to be reviewed. So um, it tells you something that there is also um, every day has only 24 hours, so there is a problem there. Um, the ERC specifically tried, or the ERC Scientific Council tried to tackle this um, um, these um, inconsistencies in order to make its peer review procedure more robust through panels, the way it set up its panels, um, through the panel members, the way it selected its panel members, um, through a very robust and very complicated, maybe even, uh, process workflow, and finally uh, through a very close observation. Uh, just at the end of my presentation, I'm just going through these four points. Um, the ERC panels, I'm sure you're aware of this, um, there are 25 panels for each funding stream, and they are predefined by the ERC. And there are always questions why there are only 25, and if it doesn't make sense to have more, and you know, special interests of certain disciplines, and, and so on and so on. But this is set very deliberately, and I'm, not, I'm no longer with the ERC, um, but I would be very surprised if over the next few years this number would change. Um, because this number, or the, to have only 25 panels, um, is, means that the panels are interdisciplinary by nature, of course. You have to bring in different um, disciplines into one, into one panel. Um, and that um, the hope is that this then will um, um, open up the people in the room, um, that they are not only looking at to, into their disciplinary, through their disciplinary lenses, but they also um, acknowledge that there are other avenues to, to certain uh, um, eminent questions. Um, the panels also are set up in a way um, that they have a lot of time to discuss. Um, so each panel meets twice in Brussels for a week, um, which means that um, you, you spend four to five days in a room with other people, not only from the discipline, but from other areas of the world and other disciplines. Um, and the intention is here to establish customary rules um, which, dis which discourage corruption and thus help ensure that the best proposals are identified. This is actually a quote from a book by Michel Lamont, um, who is a sociologist from uh, Harvard um, and who has written a very, very good book that's called How Professors Think, where she's basically looking into um, the inner workings of uh, um, um, uh, review panels. Um, and then there is also this um, idea that these panels are actually the place where the understanding, a common understanding of excellence is created. Um, this was some of the most striking um, um, experiences of my time when I was observing the ERC panels is that when I went in there for the first time, I was really startled that I heard these experts um, discussing at one point what, what excellence is. And I thought, well, you should know. I mean, that's why you're, you're here. That's why you were appointed to be a panel, mem panel member. And only gradually I realized that it was exactly this discussion was established for temporarily among these high, you know, very eminent researchers, um, which established a common understanding between them, what they are looking for in proposals and what not. And the minute they left the room and the panel work was over, this understanding, this common understanding vanished, of course because it was always in relation to the proposals that they had in front. So there is no ultimate definition of what excellence means. It's always only in this uh, temporal com um, 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 composition of the panels that if everything works out, that uh, a common understanding um, uh, can be achieved. 
The second point is the panel members of the ERC. And this also is, of course, a, um, very critical that you have the right panel members um, in the place, because I um, discussed this with Tom Hensinger before. He said that he has seen a lot of panels in his, in his past where not the appropriate people have been sit, uh, taking place in these panels. Um, I think for the ERC Scientific Council, this was a very big concern. Um, and this is also why um, the panels are, appoint, are handpicked by the Scientific Council. They are not um, like in, the, in, in other parts of the framework program, for example, where you can self-appoint yourself as a, as a, as a, as a reviewer. Um, this is really a top-down job, and it's a very secretive job. And no one knows, basically, except for the person responsible in the Scientific Council, um, how, based on what, what criteria he or she picks uh, panel members. Um, basically, there are three types of um, of reviewers in the ERC. The first one is, uh, the, the core is the panel members in the, in the middle here. Um, then there are the panel chairs who are also appointed by the Scientific Council. And then uh, there are also the remote referees uh, who are appointed by the panel members. Those are basically the specialists and the ones who are not going to Brussels, but they are just sending in their uh, written reports, their written assessment of certain projects. Those are the ones who, you know, add to uh, the broad knowledge of the of the panels themselves. Okay, um, the third piece um, with how the ERC Scientific Council tried to make the ERC, uh, peer review procedure more robust was that it has a certain process workflow um, uh, based on two steps. Um, the first steps um, is to um, where only the extended synopsis is um, um, assessed. This, by the way. A, a, one re recurring mistake of ERC applicants um, that um, they lay their most emphasis on the full proposal um, and um, then they never make it to the second stage because the um, extended synopsis is basically the text that is assessed in the first round and if it, this is not a, a very good um, if this is not a very good um, text, then you have no chance in, in making it to the second step. Second step assessment is where the full proposal is assessed. In this case of starting grant and consolidated grant, there's also the interviews. I'm sure you know that better, and for sure um, your grant proposal team uh, knows it better than I do, um, the, the, all the details and the technicalities. Um, important here is to say that there are always two steps, two routines for each step. Um, the first step, uh, the first routine is that in advance of a meeting, there are the individual reviews of applications, which are done uh, remotely. Um, and then the second step is that the panel comes together and it makes this collective assessment of the reviews and of the interview, and during the interviews also of the applicants. And this is taking place in Brussels, and this is exactly where this normalization of different expectations toward what an ERC proposal should look like, and so on and so on, um, is taking place. The fourth, um, the fourth um, way of ensuring that the ERC um, funding decision making is um, up to what is expected from it is that the scientific council is ex actually exerting a, 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 a range of observational tasks um, to, the, to, the re to the panels uh, and to the review procedure. Um, there are constant um, feedback loops with confidence in the, panel in the panels whether, the panel, whether all panel members perform. And if one panel member does not perform the way he or she should, um, she will not be or he will not be reinvited. Then there is always, uh, you know, revision of the panel descriptions. So um, whereas the overall number of 25 um, panels is not changing, um, the description of the, of the, of the panels is um, changing, I think, every year almost. So that tells you also that there is always a, um, a way of, of, of working in, uh, in this field. And then there is also always a big concern whether there are enough or too many proposals. Um, both is actually a problem for a funding agency. If there are too many proposals, it means that the panel members at one point say, well, I cannot assess so many proposals. It doesn't make any sense. Um, I quit. Um, so you have to have 
um, a certain low um, maximum number, but you also have to have a, a certain minimum number, because if, if, if overall the number of applications decline, then policymakers will say, well, apparently the ERC has reached its saturation point and we don't have to spend that much money on the ERC anymore. And there is, of course, a self-interest for the ERC to keep um, the number high. So there is a bandwidth of right number of proposals for each funding call in the case of the ERC, which I would set approximately between 2,500 to 4,000 proposals. Yeah. And... Um, this sense doesn't make any. This word, sentence doesn't make any sense. Sorry. Um, the point is that the regulation, um, and, and your grant office uh, knows that better than I do. The regulations for uh, how to apply, you know, eligibility criteria and so on and so on, uh, are changing every year. And the reason is exactly that the ERC tries to steer this point where they have uh, the right number of proposals every year. Um, I would like to finish um, to sum up for, from the perspective of um, uh, someone who's looking for funding, for research funding, why is the ERC unique? I think it's important to say again that it is not because of its philosophy, because national funding agencies have been doing the same for a long time. They have the same kind of funding streams in a way um, around. Uh, and the ERC is also not unique for uh, its decision-making principle. Peer review also been around for a long time. But the ERC is unique because it has this transnational funding, um, which gives grantees a much higher visibility than any other funding agency could do. Um, the reviewers are highly international, at least until a few years ago in many uh, European cases. This was not, uh, this was not a given. Um, and of course, international reviewers um, should avoid informal networks. Um, the panels are very interdisciplinary. This is something that is indeed very unique. Um, and the procedure is very sophisticated, which also means that it's very expensive. And with this, I end up. This is um, just a cover of my book as a brief uh, advertisement. Thank you very much.